right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Muhammad Ali. I'm the Director of Policy and Government Relations at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. We are delighted to bring you the second of our four panel series uh, this week on the uh, panel of the uh, Empowering Afghans, Reframing the Narrative and Providing Support for um, Afghans and Afghan Americans. And I'm delighted to introduce uh, Farhat Bhopal, who is going to be our moderator today. Farhat, I'll kick it off and uh, let you go forward. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Farhat Popal, and I serve as the Immigrant Affairs Manager for the City of San Diego, California, striving to be an ally and advocate for our immigrant, refugee, and asylee communities, um, and ensure that every San Diegan is afforded the opportunities they deserve and the dignity and respect uh, that is their human right. I'm honored to moderate this all-star panel today focused on resettlement challenges and opportunities as Afghan families arrive in local communities across the country. Afghan American led organizations and groups are working to provide comprehensive support and fill in gaps, particularly as the volume and pace of arrivals stretches resettlement agencies capacities to the limit. This afternoon, we'll hear from Afghan American community leaders doing this work, what they're seeing on the ground, and the challenges and opportunities in resettlement and integration of Afghans to ensure that these newly arriving families have every chance to thrive in their new home. We will hear from Zainab Nazari of the Fresh Start Refugee Assistance Center, Farishta Taib of the Afghan American Foundation, Nilo Pajwak of the Afghan American Women's Association, and Najwa Ibrahim from the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Human Trafficking. I want to spend the majority of the time hearing from our rock star uh, panelists today. So we'll start with you, Frishta. Can you set the scene for us? What might a family encounter from the time they arrive at a US military base or safe haven to when they reach the resettlement city and start to build their life here? What challenges and barriers are they encountering? Sure, uh, Salam and good afternoon, Farhad John. Thank you so much to the Muslim Public Affairs Council and the Afghan American Foundation for putting this together today. Uh, to my lovely colleagues that are here, uh, my name is Firish Tatoyev and I'm Senior Refugee Interventionist at Cornerstone Family and Marriage Intervention. Um, I see couples, adults, adolescents, and children uh, with regards to PTSD, anger management. Um, I specialize in domestic violence and counseling men who abuse um, I teach workshops on emotional wellness and parenting in the West. I also teach behavioral health interpretation for the Department of Behavioral Health Developmental Services in Virginia and Virginia Tech. In uh, 2014, I was a program director um, for an organization, Social Services Agency, that served marginalized South Asian and Middle Eastern population. And that's when I started to really work heavily. At that time, it was with the Syrian population. And as we all know, as of August 15th, all of our lives have, uh, especially Afghan American lives, have really been um, turned around. Uh, it's been a very unique and soul heavy crisis. Um, although right now my work is both on and off the base, um, I'm also still working on evacuating Afghans out of Afghanistan. Um, and Farhad John, to kind of set the scene of what families are going through and what this journey entails, um, I can say that from the beginning, you know, some families are coming from Qatar, other families are coming from different safe havens to these bases for processing. The bases have been, um, each base kind of is split up into villages, and um, the DOD has a governor. And um, this governor really uh, runs each village and they really try their best to make sure that these villages are self um, Afghan governed by the guests. But of course the DOD does oversee that. Um, there's immigration processing that occurs, health screenings, vaccinations, and eventually the goal is to get these folks resettled to their final destinations. Um, in each base, there's a mayor cell that is set up this is a place where Afghan guests can go to report complaints and issues that they see. Um, there is a DHS office, a Department of State, IOM. There are NGO offices set up, such as the Red Cross, Rubicon for donations, Catholic Charities, and the Council of the Bishops. 
So some of the challenges and, and barriers that we've been experiencing for the past few months, um, I would say that one of the first ones that I encountered was language. Um, there are bilingual folks that are interpreting. They are not trained uh, nor qualified interpreters. And instead of transmitting information, they're um, at times, not all of them, but some overstepping professional boundaries. Um, interpretation for special populations, such as refugees, has very specific techniques that include cultural brokerage, cultural advocacy, and really using third person when interpreting for children and the elderly, for example. Also, another component to this is having trauma-informed care training. When you deal with a population that comes from war and you don't have the background on how to deal with somebody who's been traumatized, traumatized this can be extremely complicated and can lead to problems which we have witnessed on the base. Another issue that we have is the ratio of staff versus the Afghan guests is quite disproportionate. There's roughly 2,000 or a bit older staff, and there's close to 15,000 guests at this point. There is, uh, seems to be a lack of cultural competence from stakeholders, but also there's a lack of cultural orientation for the actual Avon guests, right? So um, this, is, this is like a double-edged sword. Um, it's, I don't understand you, but you also don't understand me. And I know later on we'll get into the details of cultural competency and the importance of it, but important to mention that that is definitely a big problem. Obtaining medication on the basis uh, from day one was, was quite problematic. Now I think there's more of a streamlined effort and a lot of not-for-profits medical ones have stepped up, but in the beginning and up until pretty recent, that has been an issue. Donation related issues, um, but really, a lack of an Afghan American NGO presence. Um, I've, we've been trying, many different organizations have been trying to have that presence and to try to fill those gaps, um, but it's, it's, it's been a very long haul. Um, there's very long waits on departure planning. There um, is a lot of challenges when it comes to reunification process, because what happened is the journey from the airport to the United States was filled with so many steps, so much trauma, so much difficulty that essentially what ended up happening is that families were separated, spouses, children. So one of our main goals is to try to reunify folks. And we might have one sibling at one base, one at another, but it, it has a lot of challenges. There has been a lot of maternity issue issues on the base, um, miscarriages, stillborns, and with grief and loss, you know, especially in our culture, a support system is needed. A, uh, you know, we have a 40 day, a beautiful system of a 40 day support system where the whole family's there, they help, they, they bring food. So being on a military base and having this type of loss has been very problematic. Um, dealing with deaths has been very difficult. Um, and up until about a few weeks ago, the biggest challenge was with mental health issues. Um, there has been, again, the lack of understanding on both, whether it's the personnel side or with the guests. And we had an incident in which someone was almost in prison uh, because they were having a manic episode. And essentially this manic episode escalated and it turned violent. Um, so it, this was misunderstood. And if you don't have the training and you don't have the language skills or the advocacy to say, hey, I'm ill, I need help, um, then this can, this can be very easily misconstrued or misinterpreted. And unfortunately, people's lives can change as a result of this. Um, I think from day one, I've dealt with at least a dozen uh, mental health issues, um, you know, I feel like from the from Jump Street, there should have been a lot more psychological first aid training, and um, but we're learning as we're going along. You know, this has been uh, quite a a process, um, and I know I could probably send, spend the whole session talking about challenges and barriers, but I will talk about two other things. And one of the one of the most important things that we're seeing right now is independent departures. 
that is probably right now um, what's really occupying everybody's mind. An independent departure is when people are leaving the bases before they're fully processed. So what's happening is folks are getting frustrated, folks are getting misinformation, and they're leaving the bases thinking that they will receive help. And essentially what's happening is instead of waiting for IOM to receive a departure date, getting on an airplane, going to their location, having their case manager come and pick them up, take them to the hotel or the home, and then that's where resettlement begins, right? Now what's happening is you leave the base and there's this big gap, right? We have dealt with Afghans who, um, you know, have, don't have groceries, are in shelters, um, are trying to look for hotels. And that's when we get these phone calls. The community gets these phone calls. And um, we've created this New Jersey Coalition for Afghan Refugees, and we try to fill those gaps. We're trying to serve as community liaisons between the base and the resettlement agencies through this coalition to deal with housing needs, transportation needs, morale boosting events, and to fill those, those gaps of cultural competency. And but right now we're really urging people not to leave these bases because when they do, essentially, it's very, very hard to obtain the information from the base once um, they've left. It's, it's really going backwards in the process. So that's just a very brief synopsis on uh, what we've been encountered so far. Thank you so much, Frishta. That is all really helpful context for the rest of this discussion. Nilab, based on your experience and work with the Afghan American Women's Association, what are some of the unique challenges and barriers, again, that, that Afghan women and girls specifically face during the resettlement and integration process? Thank you. Um, well, the Afghan American Women Association is not new in this um, area of, of service and serving the community and, and refugees. You know that we had a big wave of um, immigrants and refugees coming back in 2014 and 2016 as well. And then some of us have come maybe 35 years ago, some 20 years ago. So we all are coming from uh, you know, refugee background at different times. And we are, what we have learned, and the reason that Afghan American Women Association was founded back in 2009, was the need for a community organization that would actually offer uh, culturally sensitive services to the community. Uh, as uh, Farishta very um, nicely put everything, laid down everything to, for us, sometimes it's not only offering services, it's how you offer that service. Um, and you do need to have uh, not only training, but also a level of compassion and understanding uh, towards refugees and the kind of life and background that they have come. Uh, unfortunately, our people are highly traumatized. There's been 40 years of war, and um, we have noticed that women and children, uh, you know, uh, they face a heavy burden of this in the family, because as you know, a mother in the family runs the family um, and faces all types of uh, challenges uh, dealing with her husband and dealing with her children. Um, most of our one woman, I would say, um, uh, you know, they may not have the language skill that their husbands may have. Uh, they, uh, even if they worked back in Afghanistan, uh, they would not be the first one who will get a job in the United States um, um, or any other country that they settled down. So as a result, they become really, uh, they lose their in independence basically. And to some extent, uh, we have noticed even the respect. Um, as we have heard, uh, you know, um, uh, heard from the bases, there's been a lot of um, domestic violence cases, unfortunately, there is um, child abuse cases. And all of this is of course, um, if not all, I mean, majority of us, it is um, stress you know, related uh, cases that are happening. And women and children are bearing all of this, right? So um, we feel that it's very important um, that um, Afghan agencies are empowered uh, to help the mainstream agencies, resettlement agencies to serve our community with this high population and that, you know, right now we need to take care of. And uh, 
we uh, as an organization and our experience uh, we see that the challenges are increasing in the first five years of resettlement rather than decreasing first as you know where you are placed that in itself could you know, put you uh, at higher risk because as you uh, may have heard, the government placement right now are in the areas of United States that have the lowest number of community uh, led organizations uh, that would include also obviously a lack of, you know, Avon community presence. Um, and also, um, the, there is this in itself, you know, puts them in more danger. Also, these are more uh, areas that are vulnerable for trafficking uh, and um, other negligence and abuse. Um, the school system, the educational system, is not as um, well supported, um, like in some other areas where we do have uh, Afghan community leadership and agencies like Virginia, California, New Jersey, New York, Chicago. Chicago. Um, so uh, all of this um, puts Afghan women and children more at risk. Um, and the solution that uh, we have come uh, to find so far is really to come together and plea um, places like uh, Department of uh, Homeland Security and Department of State to allow um, Afghan communities to become part of this resettlement process. Um, I may add also that, of course, um, as Frishta John said, um, another very, um, you know, important area of a service is mental health um, uh, services. But this, uh, uh, by this, I don't mean only professional mental health that will be taken care of by professional uh, therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and you know, well-trained translators, but also um, sort of support. Um, you know, groups and um, start from uh, a level that our people would really understand and benefit and be open to it. Uh, in our culture, uh, you just don't go to the doctor and say that, well, I have some mental problems and please help me. It doesn't happen that way. And uh, unfortunately, I've seen that also the men and the families, they uh, become really stressed because they feel so much responsibility to support their families here. And uh, you know that um, especially the uh, recently arrived families are uh, receiving very limited short-term financial assistance. So the pressure is on that they need to find a job, they need to support themselves. And many of these families are large families with seven or eight children, some of them. So um, it's very important, again, that, you know, all our community and our own mother tongues with our knowledge of like, you know, what a refugee life means and what an Avon means actually serve our community. Thank you so much, Nilov. I, I think the fact that you've been doing this work for the past decade plus um, provides some really important context and background um, in terms of the challenges, not just in this moment, but challenges that have existed, but that are now under a magnifying glass because of the pace and volume of arrivals. So thank you for, for sharing all of that. Zainab, you've been doing a lot of grassroots work in Southern California to respond to the needs of, of, of arriving Afghan families. Tell us about the role that emerging groups like Fresh Start have been playing since August and the gaps that they've been filling to ensure Afghans receive the support and guidance they need in this moment. Sure, thank you. Um, salam everyone. Thank you, uh, MPAC and Afghan American Foundation, Joseph John and Farah John for including me on this panel um, with all these talented and hardworking females. Um, my name is Zayda Mazari and I'm a first generation Afghan American clinical pharmacist uh, raised in Southern California. I am on the board of directors at Fresh Start Refugee Assistance Center uh, that provides resettlement efforts in the DMV region currently. And I've also worked with IRC in Los Angeles and local Afghan organizations in receiving newly resettled refugee families um, since August. Um, so yes, Farha John, as you have mentioned, I have been working um, with refugee families since August. Uh, Fresh Start has been involved since day one when refugees arrived at Northern Virginia Community College and have helped the newly arrived families uh, with immediate needs. And most importantly, we wanted to give them moral support during an extremely vulnerable time. Uh, the process of resettlement for these families 
are constantly changing and a Fresh Start does adapt to the needs based off of these changes. In the past few months, we've continued to help with donation drives for winter gear, home furnishings, assistance with funding and moving into permanent housing, as well as accompanying families to doctor's appointments and legal offices to offer linguistic assistance. Uh, we are currently in the process of creating an informational booklet to distribute to the families that provide basic information, such as how to use public transportation, how to call 911 in an emergency, basics of banking and finances, and discussing healthcare and medical insurance. Uh, we're also building a program with one of our partners, Operation Code, that will offer software development training to potential Avian candidates. Uh, we continue to build partnerships and programs with the focus on the needs of the individuals that we have met and worked with. Fresh Start provides supplemental resettlement services on an ad hoc basis. We work closely with resettlement agencies and nationwide networks of organizations involved in resettlement to identify and provide solutions to these ad hoc cases that we receive. Examples of cases include provide immediate funds for clothing, groceries, supplies, connect with local social services, housing search, transportation, medical health visits, linguistic assistance, and cultural orientation, among, amongst much more. Um, and mostly that is what Fresh Start and local organizations in United States have been focusing on. Um, Fresh Start is different because we have a cultural orientation um, training as well. And um, our partnerships that we've developed in the past few months, as well as in the Fresh Start has been around since 2017. So the partnerships that we developed in the past few years have really come in um, come into play during this resettlement process since August. Thank you so much, Zainab. I think that, that that point about moral support and ensuring that Afghans who have experienced all of this trauma are arriving in the United States and see someone uh, familiar, um, hear a familiar language, um, see someone who, who is welcoming them with open arms and wants to provide that support, whether it's through a hot meal or any number of other support services is, is really important and should not be sort of, you know, un underestimated. The, the power of that is, is immense. Thank you for, for the work that you, that you do. Najwa, we know that the refugee resettlement and asylum systems were gutted during the Trump administration and have not had a chance to be fully restored before encountering this volume and, and pace of arrivals. What lessons learned do you see in this moment um, from an immigration law and policy perspective? So first, I just, again, as all the panelists have done, I just want to say what an honor it is to be on this panel amongst all of you. I have to say, although I'm a panelist, I'm taking notes from, uh, and I feel like an attendee as well. So thank you, all the panelists. I'm learning a lot just being on this panel. Um, so to your question, you know, um, again, my position, I'm the legal director at the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking. We are an organization, a national organization that provides um, um, social services and legal services to human trafficking survivors across the country. Um, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm particularly invested in this issue and, and very excited to be on this panel is because of the fact that I think one of the things that's not being talked about enough, and I appreciate Nila bringing it up, is the, the issue of human trafficking and the ways in which that impacts um, immigrant communities of all different backgrounds and the way that that is also impacting um, Afghan communities here in the United States. Um, anytime, and, and to your um, question, anytime there are immigration policies that make it more difficult for individuals to get immigration status, to um, get um, um, legal authorization to work in the United States, um, anytime there are immigration policies um, that result in increased um, immigration rates, increased deportations, that result that has a direct impact on perpetuating and increasing human trafficking. And so this is why, you know, much of the work we do in addition to providing services to those who are impacted by human trafficking is we also do a lot of policy work, trying to change policies as it relates to a variety of legal areas, but including within immigration. Now, one of the things that I think, um, you know, is really important when talking about this issue is that 
a lot of people don't know what human trafficking even is. There's a lot of misconceptions about what human trafficking is. And I think um, one of the things that's important is to remember that you know, human trafficking is not just what the mainstream media often represents, which is sex trafficking, and specifically sex trafficking only of women and children, that human trafficking affects people of all different backgrounds, um, and affects both um, men and women, people of all different genders. Um, and so, and then those who are particularly vulnerable are those who are disproportionately impacted by certain laws, like, for example, immigration laws, immigration enforcement, immigration deportation. Um, now, again, what is human trafficking? Again, we work with people who are um, impacted by human trafficking, both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Um, when, when, when we're trying to understand what human trafficking is, because there's a lot of misconceptions about it, it means that what happens is people are often under-identified. And the concern is that the same is going to happen amongst Afugee, Afghan refugee communities here in the United States. Um, and, you know, again, when understanding what human trafficking is, it is not just, it's any time, just to put it sort of simply, human trafficking is any time anyone is forced to do any type of labor against their will, okay? Now that labor could be commercial sex or that could be other types of labor, okay? Whether it's working in um, a company doing engineering work, which we've had clients who were engineers being trafficked. We've had clients who were teachers being trafficked. We've had clients who were um, working as nannies being trafficked. It's literally in almost any industry here in the United States. Um, again, a common misconception about what human trafficking is, is that people think that in order for someone to be a victim of human trafficking, that they have to be um, that physical violence has to be used against them to force them to do that labor. That is not the case. Someone can be a victim of human trafficking if they um, experience force, fraud, or coercion. Okay. Now, coercion is what's really important in understanding what human trafficking is to ensure people are not getting under-identified. And specifically, when we're talking about coercion, we're talking about um, psychological control. We're talking about much of what the other panelists were talking about when it comes to um, not having access to financial resources, not having access to um, um, proper um, um, cultural competency, not having access to housing. And specifically what I mean by that is human tra when, when um, um, someone is threatened with any type of serious harm to force them to do any labor against their will, that is human trafficking. And when we're talking about immigration, something as simple as someone threatening to call immigration on somebody to force them to work is actually human trafficking. And that means there doesn't even have to be the threat, there doesn't even have to be actual physical violence. Okay, and so again, one of the one of the um, reasons why it's so important to be able to to begin to create policies around immigration that are more inclusive, that create greater access to immigration status, and that don't make immigrant communities afraid to come forward and report, is because oftentimes what traffickers will do is they will use the threat of deportation and the threat of calling immigration to force someone against their will to work. And so, um, and, and again, other things that make individuals vulnerable to trafficking is not having housing, not having access to stable housing, not having access to stable employment, not having access um, um, to just basic financial resources. And so, you know, again, if we want to ensure that Afghan refugee communities here in the United States are not um, vulnerable to being um, trafficked, and again, we're talking about both sex trafficking and or labor trafficking, we have to ensure that um, the commun Afghan communities here in the United States are having access to, again, immigration status, work authorization, communities that can provide the moral support that we were, um, that the other panelists were talking about, 
Um, again, access to housing, things like that. The other thing that's really important is exactly what we're doing here, raising awareness. Again, one of the things that we often see is that people don't even realize they're being trafficked. They think that what's happening to them might be labor exploitation, for example. And so also raising awareness about what human trafficking is, um, is one of the ways to actually prevent human trafficking or to ensure that someone can get out of a trafficking situation. Um, so again, raising awareness about what human trafficking is, um, making sure that or that there are organizations out there that are being provided um, the, 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 the um, resources and support to help Afghan communities here in the United States in the process of resettlement so that they are not preyed upon by traffickers. Um, and then again, also what is really important is being able to improve immigration policies and laws to ensure a clear path to immigration status and work authorization here in the United States. Um, and, and, you know, uh, and again, also making sure that there's also awareness about the various organizations that are out there to ensure that um, um, people know who's out there to truly help and to truly provide the resources necessary in order to be able to um, really be you know, not just survive, but thrive here in the United States. Um, and, you know, I will get into later in the panel, if we have time, into ways that, um, um, again, Afghan communities here in the United States can find, based on what's existing in the immigration laws, a path to um, permanent immigration status. Thank you, Najwa. I think the, the major takeaway here is that the vulnerabilities and the risks that Afghan families face don't end when, when they arrive in a resettlement city. Those vulnerabilities continue to exist for all of the reasons that, that you've just mentioned. First up, we're going to come back to you. You've been doing a lot of work to ensure that services are provided in a way that take cultural awareness into consideration, as we've already discussed during this panel. Why is this so important? And what are some of the most important cultural factors that should be incorporated into policy and programmatic decisions specifically where possible? So prior to this crisis, um, I was providing resettlement agencies with cultural competency trainings. And um, now the need has grown. We went from 25 participants per training to now 250 to 500 participants per training. Um, cultural awareness is, is quintessential for people to feel heard, to feel seen, um, and to feel understood, right? Language and culture makes a person's, it helps to shape and build their identity, right? So in order for you to serve a particular population and be able to build that rapport and trust with that particular population, you must understand them and make them feel um, seen and heard. And I see it all the time. People come uh, on the base and they go through clinics and they learn things and um, they're given advice. Uh, but the, the moment that uh, myself and my two Afghan American colleagues get on the base, we see uh, people running and um, they ask us, they feel comfortable and daddy to say, is this really true? Is this really going to happen, right? There is this level of comfort when it's, it's your own or when you feel understood or those people who are learning cultural competency on the base will have their hand to their chest and say salam and you know a small gesture like that makes a world of a difference you see that the person's face just light up right um also it's it's cultural awareness when it comes to the Afghan population especially because of a lot of the population suffering or should say experiencing is a better word, PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, it's really important. And I, and I really hope and I wish that um, these cultural factors um, that will be included in whether it's programming or whether it's, it's policy, that um, budgets are created to include 
covering mental health services. Mental health services that include counseling, right? Because uh, as you love John said previously, right? She said that um, an Afghan is not just gonna walk up to a mental health clinic and say, hi, I need therapy. That's not how it works but to provide these safe spaces, right? So something that I've been doing is as soon as a group of uh, individuals come off of the base and they're being resettled, the resettlement agency will call Cornerstone and say, hey, we have this new group. Okay, great, let's do a meet and greet. And believe it or not, that meet and greet turns into a support group. To have funding for programs like that, support groups, right? To have funding to deal with women who are, survivors of domestic violence, who are now in this country, who now know their rights, who want to build and, and leave and live a better life. So essentially to have these culturally competent programming, right? Dietary requirements, not restrictions, requirements, right? Um, to be taken uh, very seriously in schools, right? If there's a uh, a family who only eats halal, you're going to bring them something from the cafeteria, and if they know that it's not sabiha, uh, they're not going to eat it. So to to you, people may think that these things are very small, but in the grand scheme of things, they make a very big difference, right? Um, religious obser observations to be um, included, um, holiday celebrations to be included, um, taking into consideration literacy levels, uh, you wouldn't believe how many programs I've attended, how many meetings I've attended. And I, I hear these conversations like, let's make this and give it out. And let's create this literature. But are we really taking into consideration that perhaps this particular population's literacy levels may not be as high as one would think, right? So providing uh, programming that's going to cater to that particular population providing trained and qualified interpreters, not family members or community members. How many times somebody goes to the doctor and they have an issue and they bring a family member, a community member, and they're embarrassed to really truly speak about what the issue is because they're being asked to use them as interpreters. It, it should be a part of, it is, and it should continue to be a part of funding, right? Um, and gender segregated, orientation classrooms, right? Assimilation is a process. The refugee curve on average usually takes one to three years, right? Before people there's, um, and if you guys are not familiar, please look it up. There is, a, it's a, like a bell curve and it shows the different stages of assimilation. And in the beginning, you can't expect that, that you know, the female interaction and the male interaction is gonna happen overnight. So to have this type of gender segregated space as a safe haven for women to learn and to feel comfortable and is very, very empowering. And there's so many different things that I've seen come out of these spaces. It, it starts as an ESL class and that it turns into a counseling session. It turns into um, so many other things come up there and people really feel free. And then once they've gone through this curve and they're fully assimilated, then of course that you know the genders will integrate. And but to provide that in the beginning, especially during the orientation, because they're very gender specific things that um, we have to we have to think about when it comes to our culture and how to deal with that. Even on the base, I see it. A woman will not feel comfortable to ask for a feminine product from a male interpreter, and they would rather have something happen than for, for them to be able to open up about something like that. Again, to us, it seems small, but in the grand scheme of things, these are, these are um, things that'll help on a larger scale, I hope. Uh, last thing I will say, sorry, Fadhojan, is that creating literature, references, handbooks for service providers on our culture um, and, and, and the cultural factors, I think that it's starting and I'm happy to see it and I'm happy to see the interest and people are interested but for that not to not to dis disseminate as as Afghanistan comes off of media, not for that to dissipate, but for it to really be encouraged and continued. Absolutely. Well, thank you for for reminding all of us why this is so important, and all of the 
the, the nuances behind it and the impact that it can have in the lives of Afghans as they are resettling. I mean, trust is an important thing. And it's in moments like that that you're building trust over time. Um, and all of that helps with integration in, in the long term. So thank you for, for sharing. Nilab, going back to the specific factors affecting uh, Afghan women and girls, what do you think the public, private, and nonprofit sectors and everyday Americans should take into account when working to support Afghan women and girls? Well, I think um, a lot of good points were covered by Freshta already, uh, which would be an answer to this question as well. Um, because in terms of culture and you know, those sensitivities, considering those, keeping those in mind um, is very important. And it's the, the start you know, to uh, really uh, feel, um, like make these families feel comfortable here and welcome. Um, but I would um, touch base on um, kind of more um, you know, holistic approach here that we are hoping from our mainstream partners and from other agencies who are on this call today uh, is that um, to listen to Avrons really, um, to uh, empower us, um, you know, uh, as partners, as equals. Um, uh, for example, the Avron American Women Association is a uh, women-led, uh, fully volunteer-based organization. And we have survived all these many years um, beside doing our professional work, which is to, for most of us is totally a separate, you know, like a different professional area and then volunteering and social uh, work also, because some of us are uh, had background in this, uh, but uh, some of us are also doing it out of interest and compassion, of course. Um, but, um, to uh, you know, listen to us and to provide us with funding. Uh, funding is becoming an issue. Uh, and I will ho honestly say to uh, everybody on this call, the other agencies who are um, uh, you know, um, attending, is that uh, we are overwhelmed by the level of expectation also from the Afghan community. We are asked from left and right to fill in the gaps. Um, and everybody thinks that maybe we have these additional resources, you know, uh, that may not be really the case, uh, including even finding volunteers who have to work hard themselves uh, to make life. Right. Um, so um, right now, the Afghan American Women Association is working with a number of other Afghan agencies like the Afghan American Foundation, Afghan American Medical Professionals, um, AMPA, Fresh Start. Um, I mean, everybody, some of us on this call, we know that there is an effort uh, also by um, another group, the National uh, Refugee Crisis Committee who are trying to organize the uh, you know, Avon community together and try to get funding for our agency so we can hire part-time, full-time staff um, and ensure really effective um, you know, services that our uh, these resettling uh, population deserves. Um, so uh, one thing is that you bring people from a war-torn war country, but another thing is that you uh, you you further traumatize them and then you expect them to uh, you know basically um, uh, you know overcome everything and be successful so we are definitely concerned especially again for women and children uh, as they start their new life here uh, that is full of challenges although very hopeful life uh, a journey uh, towards uh, you know um, uh, financial independence but they have a long way to go and um, um, right now, uh, our also is, you know, focusing on uh, midterm and uh, long term, you know, programs for this population with the hope that we will get some funding and uh, resources that is needed to do that because um, it's like, you know, when a family invests in their children. It's the same way when a society brings in refugees, they need to invest in them like their own 
members of family. And that's when we will get good results. Uh, we also have heard a lot about uh, some other uh, type of like, um, you know, uh, discrimination uh, already uh, going on against uh, Afghan refugees. Um, there are some uh, places that they refuse to, uh, you know, basically even rent out places for them or give them jobs. Um, so another thing that I would remind everybody will be like, it's really good if you are respectful of their space also and we do not get too personal. I've seen many times, many occasions that people are asking very personal questions about these families, you know, and from these families. And it's really hard. And out of politeness in our culture, they feel that they have to answer them. You know, culturally, we are not told that, yeah, you can say that, look, this is personal. I'm not going to answer you. So, um, and the other factor is that also keep in mind that many of them have been, uh, you know, they have this fear as part of their life. Uh, it's come from 40 years of war, from um, governments and systems that maybe uh, they couldn't trust and they were abused by them. So, um, for our law enforcement agencies, we request them to be patient with them and to understand that some of them might be very fearful and hesitant to respond to some of their questions. We have had cases of, as it, you know, again, I um, mean, minor, you know, domestic violence type of situations or child abuse that has escalated to something else. And this has resulted that, you know, these families lose the head of the family, basically. Uh, the person goes to jail or something, and that doesn't help the woman and the children left behind. So while the system is trying to help, is also putting, you know, endangering and putting these families in, in higher risk. So, um, so those are some of the things, and, and we, uh, on the other hand, the Afghan community, I think, has realized that this is the time that we need to come together and to support each other and also find a solution together on national level to, uh, you know, uh, meet these, uh, this crisis. Uh, so we definitely are expanding our volunteer services also on the site as much as possible. Um, so, I mean, uh, other... I think this is this is all we we covered so many challenges here, but it is also um, maybe a good uh, you know closing remarks for me would be that we need to think of you know programs and plans to address these challenges. We also don't want to be expecting and demanding for things that are not possible. As we know here in the society, uh, many you know people who were born in America also has a lot of financial, economic, and other types of you know racial. Uh, all types of other uh, challenges. So we are very aware of that also. And as Rishta John said, it's a double sword type of education uh, that we need to do um, on both sides. So the expectations are managed and the services are provided um, in, in most sensitive and effective way to our people, to Afghan refugees. Thank you, Nilob. I think one, one thing that, that really stood out to me is just the, the fact that you know, this, this is not a short-term response. This support is going to be needed to Afghan-American-led organizations um, and other groups who are responding in, in this moment in the long term. And that has implications for policy and programmatic decisions, right? It's, it's not just uh, support to get Afghan families to their resettlement cities, but once they are in their resettlement cities, that real... Uh, intensive sort of both resettlement and integration support is, is going to be needed. So thank you for, for sharing that really in-depth um, overview of, of the needs for, for Afghan women and girls and, and children overall. Zainab, what support do grassroots Afghan-American-led groups need to be able to do this work, again, not just in the short term, but to be able to provide that long-term integration and community support? So, um, Based off of what Frisha John and Nilab John have already said, um, funding. Funding is the most important, most important need that Afghan American led organizations and Muslim American led organizations need currently. Um, as we all know, the resettlement agencies were underfunded and did not receive the support they needed during the previous administration. The funds for the Afghan refugees that have arrived have already been allocated um, to recognize resettlement agencies nationwide. 
The number of Afghans that have arrived since August are close to 80,000. And as I'm sure all of us on this panel have heard this over and over again, the resettlement agencies are overwhelmed. Milab John just stated it again. Um, we, at Fresh Start yesterday, we had two cases. Um, we received two cases yesterday. One of them, we had a child, or they had, a family had two children, two young daughters, and they were in school. One of them tested positive for COVID yesterday during, at school, and the other one had lice. And that's just one case. We needed translators for that parent. We needed translators to translate to the school. We needed translators to go to the doctor's office. There's one family can just take up a whole day. And it's really important that PRM, ORR does realize that importance that we need to have American, Afghan American caseworkers working on these families. Um, and I'm going to quote something that senior policy advisor at DHS, Horace Harin, said a few weeks ago on a call, stating that we need to have an Afghan fund specifically for Afghan American-led organizations and Muslim American-led organizations. It's extremely important. We need to hire Afghan American caseworkers that are culturally competent to be able to support these families in ways that resettlement agencies are not able to. I mean, that was just the second case that we had yesterday was. Um, fortunately enough, we have a PA on our board. And so she was assessing a patient and um, he had a bacterial infection. And when you have a bacterial infection, we they, no one in the family knew that this patient had a heart defect, it was born with a genetic heart defect. And when you have that and you have some type of infection, it can be very deadly. So there's, there's things like that that we need to have assistance for, and in order for that to happen, we need to, we need to define the whole, redefine the whole resettlement process from beginning to end. And because it has been broken for so long, and we've received so many refugees in the past three months, or what is it's December now? What is it, four months now? Five months? But that's extremely important for all of us to. Um, to work on as Afghan Americans, as Muslim Americans. And in regards to long-term needs, um, we need community support. We need Muslim community support so much, so much. I can't even emphasize that. We're trying to come together as an ummah to, to help people, to help a people that didn't deserve anything that happened to them. And we need everyone to volunteer their time, to volunteer their mentorship skills, whatever they can. Afghans will not be able to do this alone. This, this has to be a nationwide effort, has to be an international wide effort. And it's God, I mean, God help us all. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. I think it's it's important in, in addition to, to humanizing um, the experience of, of Afghan families, I think also humanizing um, the experience of the Afghan American community and, and clearly what a toll this is taking um, on, on the community and the level of support that is needed um, from, from across various sectors, from across various um, populations in, in American society and, and internationally. So thank you for um, for, for humanizing you know, your, your own experience and, and sharing that with us. Najwa, given the number of Afghan arrivals who are here as humanitarian parolees, uh, which is a temporary status of, of two years, what resources are needed to ensure that Afghans have legal representation to be able to adjust their status and aren't deported after having reached safety in, in the US? So, you know, what, one thing that I, I, I want to say about um, various access to certain types of immigration status, um, and I, I, I'm going to redirect a little bit again to my specialization, which is human trafficking, is, you know, one of the, one of the areas that people don't realize they have access to immigration status is as a trafficking victim. So there, there is obviously, there are ways that people can access permanent status through applying for asylum, fear of persecution in home country, but then there's also specifically what's called a T visa. It's a specific visa for those who are trafficking victims here in the United States. 
Um, as you mentioned, you know, again, people, those Afghan communities that are coming here to the United States, the experience of victimization doesn't just stop once they get here. That there is, there is ongoing issues of victimization as a result of everything the panelists spoke about, including um, issues around human trafficking. And so, um, but unfortunately, again, one of the most underutilized visas is the T visa, is the trafficking visa. Why? Because number one, as I mentioned earlier, people do not realize that they're even trafficking victims. Um, or number two, they're afraid to come forward as trafficking victims because of the ways in which immigration policies have been such that it makes people afraid of deportation or afraid of being targeted as a result of immigration enforcement. Um, now, with respect to the T visa, that is a direct path to um, a green card. Um, that is a direct path to um, um, permanent status. Um, you know, so... Um, but in terms of additional resources, so what is needed in order for people to be able to have um, access to permanent status, to access to security, the resources, everything that everyone's talking about, making sure that um, um, Afghan community organizations are properly funded to be able to provide Afghan communities here in the US, the types of resources to be able to even assert their legal rights. Right, so if you don't have access to housing, you don't have access to basic income, you don't have access to food, you can't even begin to imagine how to then access your legal rights. And so that is absolutely essential, even in terms of being able to assert legal rights to stat to immigration status. Um, um, but also raising awareness. It is so important for, for um, more and more panels like this to raise awareness about some of the challenges um, that um, Afghan communities here in the United States are experiencing as a result of the whole resettlement process. Um, and then also raising, raising awareness about what are the rights um, that people have to um, certain legal rights, as well as their rights to resources and services. Um, and, and again, all of this absolutely necessary to ensure that we are doing what is all of our collective responsibility, not just Afghan community organizations, not just Muslim organizations, but all of our responsibility as human beings is to ensure that the refugee communities here in the United States coming from Afghanistan have what they need not just to survive, but to thrive. That is our responsibility, all of us. So, you know, um, again, I think that, you know, uh, just echoing what all the panelists said, continuing to do panels like these, and really making sure that the money is being properly directed to organizations that are truly providing the support needed to Afghan communities in a way that's trauma informed and culturally competent. Thank you very much, Najwa. I, I think that's a that's a really important note, um, sort of to, to end on uh, that the support needs to be trauma informed. It needs to be culturally competent. It needs to um, incorporate all of the factors that that all of our panelists today have have really done a great job of um, of detailing in in uh, in in detail. Um, I know that we are at time, so I want to thank our panelists, their incredible work, the work of the organizations that they represent, the volunteers that give their countless time um, to, to, to doing this work and responding during this really critical moment for our new Afghan neighbors. And Thank you to everyone in the audience for being here today. Um, I know that we have uh, posted some of the information for the organizations and our wonderful panelists in the chat. Um, and so hopefully you can, can be in touch. As a reminder, we have the Afghan American Women's Association, Fresh Start Refugee Assistance Center, the Afghan American Foundation, um, and the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking represented here today. Thank you all very much.